Okay, the first question I'll need to ask you just will be to tell us uh, your name. So in case some people don't remember who you are, say, I'm Bob, Robert, whatever you go by, Sherman. Okay. And I have been teaching you. Right. I taught at TAM from what years through what years. Okay, let me get started. All right, go ahead. Okay, I'm Bob Sherman. Uh, it occurs to me that when students first entered my class at the beginning of the school year, uh, occasionally a student would ask me, uh, uh, Mr. Sherman, would it be all right with you if I called you Bob? And I said, certainly, was my conventional answer. Certainly, beginning the day you graduate from this high school. In the meantime, you may call me Mr. Sherman. In the meantime, okay. Well, I graduated. Can I call you Bob now? <laughs> By all means. Okay. Yeah, I graduated from college. Okay, what years were you teaching at TAM? After two years in Grass Valley, at Grass Valley. I started here in 1959. Had planned to teach until the end of this very year. Today, my projected last day of teaching. Maybe 28 years would have been this day. No, I had planned on 30, 30 years of teaching and retiring at the age of 60. Mm -hmm. I actually retired just before the age of 59 after having started my 29th year of teaching. I had just too many major surgeries. I just couldn't come back after mm -hmm. that. So, and as far as retirement is concerned, uh, I cannot describe to you how much I am enjoying it. Oh, you're enjoying it? I was oh. You say the other side of the coin. That I no, despise. I can't imagine anything I would rather do. <laughs> it's true, I miss teaching very much, but by teaching I mean uh, physical in-class presence, students, the intercourse between students and teachers, and the rapport that existed was such an unbelievably satisfying thing. I would walk out uh, of my classroom at times, not all my lectures were successful, I would walk out of my classroom just dancing on a cloud, <laughs> feeling that, that way, that a euphoria. Work. It was most satisfying teaching. But in retirement, which I'm enjoying so much as I told you, whenever I think of the good old days when I was teaching and enjoying it so much, I immediately qualify that that longing for going back to the classroom with thoughts of the things I, I hated most. I dislike intensely grading students. Uh, grading calls, uh, theoretically at least, calls upon a teacher to be infallible and to give the student the exact grade that that student deserves. It's also and hard. It's not easy to do. There are objective factors. You see them right in the grade book. There are subjective factors. Uh, to what degree did this student contribute to the quality of the total course offering? Uh, to what degree did this student make it impossible for me to teach as effectively as I otherwise felt I could have? Well, these are positive on one hand and negative on the other hand factors that I felt should be included in a grade. But I hated grading if I were really endowed, which was frequently the case. I would give the student, if I were torn between two grades, I would always give the student the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. yeah. Um, sure yet the students uh, some students... Appreciated that. Well, uh, some did, yes. Uh, Mr. Sherman, you overgraded me. And I said, well, I certainly didn't do it uh, deliberately. Or with malicious... And I'm not about to reduce your grade. How many students have ever come in and said, reduce my grade? Uh, you would be surprised. Uh, the answer is only several. But uh, even over my 28 years of teaching, I quit in my 29th year, um, the fact that there were several students who felt that my, their grade should be reduced and came to me and told me so was, to me, uh, well, the, the surprise. And there were there were students who felt, uh, despite my philosophy of grading, that I had uh, undergraded them, and I felt bad about it. And if I felt I had no basis on this earth to change their grade upward, I wouldn't. That's, that's a tough break. Let me ask you some differences uh, over the years. You were at TAM for three, the better part of three decades. What obvious or subtle differences did you see in the students and lifestyle, 60s, 70s, and 80s? I knew you would answer, ask me that question because you told me you would. I gave the matter some thought and felt, oh, there is one factor that 
has been true of virtually, well, I would even throw out that qualification. One thing that has been true of my students, all of my students, all of my classes of students since the day I started teaching, and that is uh, uh, the idealism of young people. They're out to create a, a better world. That never changes, they always That has been a constant, the idealism of young people. I do feel as people get older, they get jaded, a little more materialistically minded, whatever, facing the realities and the necessities of human existence, they, they may not uh, hold on to that idealism that they express as, youth, uh, as, as uh, youthful people. Uh, so much as they get older, they become jaded and not out to change the world. Well, pinpointing the, the 70s for a minute, right? can you pinpoint any uh any students or any kind of period that would make you remember something of 77, 76, the year our group was there? I knew you would ask me that, uh, as you mentioned. Um, I can't say the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s. So much as I can say uh, roughly from the 50s when I started teaching to uh, the early 60s, the students were definitely idealistic, as I have said, but in a very, very quiet way. Um, a good students, uh, submissive to authority, submissive to authority, as a rule, as a general rule. <laughs> Ask Aristotle, he would tell you that uh, well, <laughs> such things cannot be depended upon. Uh, there's always the exception, and there are far more exceptions uh, than the rule would seem to indicate. But um, Let's see, from the 50s to the early 60s, and in the early 60s we had such things as the assassination of John F. Kennedy, and we had, uh, oh, the assassination of the very reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. following his peace march at Washington, D.C., his assassination in was Memphis, Tennessee. Um, students who were idealistic but quiet had changed from being idealistic but quiet to remaining highly idealistic but in a very, very, I don't like the word aggressive, ostentatious may be a better word, but yes, they were out to change the world and they were out to violate any rule that stood in the way of their making a better world than the one they saw about them, which they didn't like, and it's the world that my generation handed them, and they hated it. And they went on uh, peace marches. I myself participated in the peace marches. I think I'm richer for the experience of having had uh, so many students who were so high-minded that they tended to keep my mind younger than it may otherwise have turned out to be. But. Um, uh, yes, uh, there's such a thing as peaceable assembly being guaranteed by our Constitution, and I was a part of many peaceable assemblies. Those that turned out to be not peaceable, in my opinion, turned out to be not peaceable assemblies. Not in spite of, but because of the police, the ever-present police, some of whom I felt were much too aggressive. I'll stop on that note, well, up to and through. The, uh, now that era of being aggressively idealistic, there is that word, used deliberately now, um, lasted, oh, you might say, certainly through the Vietnam War. And that brings us to the mid-70s. And from the mid-70s, there was a very, very gradual, but nevertheless perceptible change, which, as I see it, lasts, has lasts and has lasted pretty much right up to the present, where students, uh, never losing their idealism, gradually, gradually quieted down and how would I put it? Um, to the recent past and present, where you have uh, what I would call the unique combination of 
These students of this era, right now, graduating high school students, as I see it, who are not only idealistic, but materialistic as well. During the 60s, a favorite major of so many students was psychology, a very tough major to solve. Um, now, oh, the favorite major, I believe, I think we're talking about a higher level of education, though, it would be business administration. They want to make it in this world, but they also want to create a better world, knowing, as I'm sure many, many, many are aware of, that the world they create today will be the world in which they retire. And I hope they retire happily and pleased and satisfied with the world that they will have. The world they create today will be the world in which they retire. And I hope they retire happily and pleased and satisfied with the world that they will have helped to uh, create. Let me ask you a question about some of the students you've had. Uh, have, had it, have there been any students that have stood out in your mind that have gone on to do extraordinarily well in the outside world? People that have made a name for themselves. You people. told me you would ask me that question. And when I hung up after you had spoken to me a couple of days ago, a names just started running through my mind. Oh, yes. I'll never forget so-and-so who has done such and such, and I'll never forget X, I'll never forget Y, and A, B, C, D, E, and F. And I thought of specific names and specific instances that I would mention to you, but I felt I've had so many over 28 uh, plus years of teaching. I've had so many great students that if I were to do so much as mention one single name, or even worse, if I were to mention half a dozen, I would err on the, I would be committing the sin of erring by omission. There have just been so many wonderful students who have done so many wonderful things. Were I to name names, many young people would feel left out. Why is it that he didn't think of me when I have done so many wonderful things? Well, I can't think of everyone, and as I say. Uh, have there been students, say, without naming names, that have done well, that you thought really were on the wrong track, you thought this guy might not cut it, won't amount to anything, and then surprised you and made something out of his life? Yes. Life. Yes, definitely. I've. Uh, with one exception, a student who lied in writing to me on the qualifications that she possessed and why she should be accepted at Harvard. Uh, well, I asked her to let me know a few things about her that I might not otherwise know and I'll write as good a letter as I possibly can. Well, she uh, told me in writing that she was a part of the band, orchestra, a band that had gone to Vienna. And the more specific you make a letter of recommendation, the more effective it could be. So I called her home, asked for her. She was not home, her mother was. And I asked the mother, uh, what instrument did this, uh, did uh, so-and-so play at Vienna when Tam achieved international fame? And the mother told me, Oh, my daughter plays the violin, but uh, she was not a part of the group that went to Vienna. So uh, that uh, young lady received a bad letter of recommendation and was not accepted at Harvard. But no, I didn't tell her I wrote her a lousy letter, but I certainly did. Um, in all other cases, if a student asked me to write a letter of recommendation, for that student for a given college or several colleges. If I felt that I could not write a good letter, I would tell that student so, and did tell that student so, and suggested that they find someone, some teacher, who could write something that would be more favorable and that would, that would enhance their chances. That's interesting. One student came to me and said, uh, Mr. Sherman, I would like you to write a letter for me to Brown University. And I said, I, 
I can't write a good letter. Brown is a very prestigious university, and you simply don't qualify by their standards as I see and feel I know you. I can't write a good letter for you. And he said, well, they want a, a letter from my coach. I'm good at soccer, and my coach is providing that letter. They also want a letter from an academic teacher, and I want a letter from you. And I said, but look, I just told you I cannot write you a good letter. See someone else. He said, no, I thought over my list of academic teachers, and I need one, a letter from an academic teacher. And you're it. So I wrote to Brown University, and I said, yes, this student uh, did uh, reasonably, as a matter of fact, quite well in my classroom. But in my opinion, A minus, that's not bad at all. But in my opinion, this student is so super grade conscious, worried about grades more than knowledge, so super grade conscious that it is my considered opinion that if you were to accept this individual at a prestigious university such as yours, he would get an ulcer before he would get a degree. And I suggest that you do this student the favor of rejecting him. But he insisted on the letter, and yeah. I wrote it honestly. Every letter I've written, I feel, has been totally honest. Uh -huh. Did he get in? <laughs> I think that answers your question. <laughs> well, let's reflect one, on one more question here. Uh, looking back over the years, has there been a time that you look back on with, with fond memories, uh, an experience or a, a year that was memorable. When you think of your years at TAM, what time might you think of as being extra special? I'll tell you something that I've always looked forward to with great trepidation and fear, and virtually without exception, have looked back upon with elation uh, for I study very hard uh, to prepare my lectures, but for some reason, my Civil War lectures, as a matter of example, seem to come out quite well. And the reputation, you may recall the Civil War lecture. What was the final day? Uh, pardon me. Uh, uh, the semester? Uh, last day of the first semester. Yes, I devoted the final exam time, having already given a last examination for the semester. I devoted the entire final exam period to a lecture on the Civil War. The students. Uh, the word spread among students, you've got to hear Mr. Sherman's lecture on the Civil War. Now, that was a reputation that I could have happily lived without, because it was my knowledge of their anticipation that you're going to see a great show. <laughs> that was the student's poor knowledge, or what they anticipated, that I found it extremely difficult knowing that the students expected me to put on a good show, and knowing at the same time that I just might fall flat on my face in the course of delivering that particular lecture. And yes, I do recall the time that I did fall flat on my face. The lecture was a disappointment to all present, including, you can be sure that a bad lecture is not only a disappointment to my students, as well as anybody. but uh, it, it hit hard right here. I know it was bad. I know I'm when I'm delivering a poor lecture. And it really bugs me. <laughs> and yes, that really hurt. But I disappointed all present on that particular Civil War lecture. But generally, they come out good. But since I speak extemporaneously, I have no canned lectures, nothing memorized. Simply like to feel that I know what I'm talking about. And it usually comes out well. Not always is that the case. So. Uh, Yes, I look back very, very fondly upon my students' warm reception of my Civil War lecture. I look back extremely fondly upon the students' warm reception of my entire year-long class presentation. Oh, I recall once at the end of a Civil War lecture, and this is when I gave it in segments. Um, the, in the last few days of the first semester, I would reach the Civil War, and knowing that final exam time was scheduled for an hour and a half or whatever, a couple hours, um, I gave the Civil War lecture in segments. This was after about, oh, 12 years of teaching. 
And as I finished that lecture, as the bell rang, the students just burst into applause. It, uh, it had never happened to me before. Uh, my students suddenly bursting into applause because I had just lectured to them. That was in room 19. But uh, I will say that since then, uh, upon the conclusion of my Civil War lecture, and once in a while, a few others, such as my lecture on the very reverend doctor, I won't call him anything else, Martin Luther King, Jr. Yes, uh, from time to time, the students have burst into applause. Yeah, the, the end of my lecture, hardly what you would call a lecture, my personal recollections of the Great Depression, yes, would uh, leave the students both crying and applauding. <laughs> Ah, well, I, I live with the warm compliments I've received and look upon uh, my career as having been very successful. I enjoyed it, but uh, I would not want to come back. It's too hard a job. Teaching takes all your time. Hmm? Put in 28 good years? Uh, teaching takes anymore. all your time. Um, I felt I didn't have quite enough time left to even give my own children the degree of attention that each and all of the four of them deserved and needed. Here I was preparing my lessons when I feel I should have better or expended my time devoting my attention to my own children. I couldn't do that, not only that. That could be said about a lot of careers, a lot of... Right. Oh, I'm sure of that, and that's a very good observation. But I'll add this qualification. A lot of careers in which people spend that kind of time on their jobs are commensurately uh, rewarded in pecuniary fashion. Good uh, pay, hard work, good pay. I didn't have enough money, I didn't make enough money as a school teacher to send my own children to the prestigious colleges that I would like them to have been able to have gone to. I could not afford it. Teachers have been, are, and will continue to be in the foreseeable future, which I think will continue at least as long as I live. Teachers will continue to be underpaid, not because boards of directors do not love teachers, but because boards of directors are so financially strapped themselves that they cannot give teachers the amount of money that they feel the teachers so richly deserve. Mm -hmm. that's, that's why a lot of people don't choose teaching, a lot of very I would, qualified people. I would recommend that highly qualified teachers, uh, highly qualified young people who might enjoy going into teaching, check their financial situation before they make the decision, or as they make the decision as to whether or not to go into teaching. If they are financially secure, then I would recommend to them as one of the most psychologically rewarding experiences you could ever conceive, be a teacher because you don't have to worry about money, but to those financially strapped who would like to devote their lives to teaching young people, I would say think twice.